Ladies and gentlemen, can we stand? Thank you. Please be seated. It's my, um, I'm Wesley Garrett. It's my privilege on behalf of the Lanning family and the Oscar families to welcome you today. Thank you for coming. I should just say one thing. If you've got a cell phone, please turn it off. The family do appreciate your presence here and even the presence of those who are watching uh, via the internet. I was the MC at Alex's wedding 39 years ago, a lovely bush setting in South Auckland. And never in my life did I expect to be the MC here today. But life is short. One thing my father used to do when we'd go on holidays would be to take us to visit cemeteries and we would read the inscriptions on the tombstones and the best one we found was in Queenstown at the bottom of the gondola and it said these four simple sentences it says life is short second one was death is sure sin sin s-i-n sin the wound all of us have been wounded by sin Christ the cure and um, I'm so glad that Alex found the cure you know Alex is the first son of Daphne and Alec his father passed away last year and as I was thinking about this I was thinking dear Daphne our heartfelt sympathies go to you it's not normal and natural for a mother to see her son die. I know when my sister Christine died how much it upset my mother. And uh, our prayers are with you, Daphne, that God's love and the love of your family, the love of the brothers and sisters would fill somewhat that void that's been left with the passing of your firstborn son. You know, the family asked me to say a brief word is of what is the hope that we, believers in Christ, have. You know, it, the Bible says it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of merriment. And it's so good that you and I could be here. It's so good to see so many young people here today. 
because here we remember our end. All of us are going to have to face this day. And as I was thinking is about what is the hope of the believers, my consideration was Alex Lanning loved the Bible. I met him in 1977 at Auckland University, and we've been companions since that time. And his love for the Bible caused him to want to serve his God for the whole of his life. And in the Bible, when you look at how man was created, man was created in a most incredible way. Man was created in the image of God, as a vessel to receive God. But the first generation was deceived, was disobedient, chose the tree of knowledge rather than the tree of life. And this is an incredible thought that God gave man, the man whom he created, a free will. And you and I today still have a free will. Man fell and something got into man and what got into man was what the Bible calls sin. Another nature entered into man, which causes man not only to sin, but eventually to die. But with that first fall, God immediately came into this man and promised something. He promised that a descendant of the woman would bruise the head, would crush the head of the serpent, the one who deceived them. And so 4,000 years later, in God's eyes, that is only four days. We think 4,000 years is a long time. God says, no, 1,000 years is just one day. So 4,000 years later, something incredible happened on this earth. God became a man. You would think it would make the headlines. No, God doesn't do things that way. God does things in a very sneaky, hidden way. God was born in a manger, a place where the animals would feed. He was born of a virgin. And he lived a perfect human life, the only man ever to live a perfect human life. And then, at the age of 33, he went to the cross and died for us. The Romans didn't put him to death. The Jews didn't put him to death. God put him to death. It says he made his soul an offering for sin. And this, brothers and sisters, friends, relatives, is the greatest event that has transpired on this earth, the death of a God-man. This is the most incredible death it accomplished so much. And I remember still at Auckland University, I think it was 1978, and Alex was actually speaking about the death of Christ. And he used this term, the all-inclusive death of Christ. And I remember someone coming up after the meeting asking to Alex, why did you use this term, all-inclusive death of Christ? It's not too many things I remember at the Auckland University, but I do remember this. And if you were to study the death of Christ, you would see it as an all-inclusive death. Because of who Christ was, his death was so significant, incredibly significant. And um, his death took away the sins of the world. Could you imagine that? His death destroyed the devil. His death released the life of God that was concealed within him, making that life available to whoever believed. You know, this is a marvelous thing. Christ died, but he was raised on the third day. You know, resurrection means to stand again. And our firm belief is that Alex is lying here. He will stand 
again. He will stand again. And why will he stand again? Because he is joined organically to the one who walked into death and came out of death. We have the confidence, the absolute assurance that just as the sun will rise tomorrow, Alex Lanning will rise from the dead. There's no doubt about this. There's absolutely no doubt. So I just want to read to you one verse. And then after that, we are going to have um, the family come up. Oh, no, we're going to sing a song, aren't we? We are. We're going to sing a song. Isn't it good to sing? You're going to have to sing a song from my spirit within. But after we've sung that song, we'll have the family come up in three groups. We're so happy to have Daphne here, Derek and Gerald, Sarah, which is Jenny's sister, Deborah, Jenny and Alex's firstborn, then Peter, and then finally Jenny Lanning will say something. But let me read to you. I should have really brought a hard copy, you know, of the Bible. It says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. What is Alex doing right now? He's sleeping. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In the moment... In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. And when this corruptible will put on incorruption and this mortal will put on immortality, then the word which is written will come to pass. Death has been swallowed up unto victory. Let's just pray. Lord Jesus, we commit this whole time to you. We thank you for Alex Lanny, a son, a brother, a husband, a father, a companion, a brother in Christ. We thank you for his life. We just have to worship you and acknowledge that you do all things well. We love you, Lord Jesus. Let's stand and sing this first hymn. From my spirit within flows a fountain of life.
Hello, I'm Daphne, Alex's mother. A lot of people will know me from the church and from my friends who are here, and of course my family. Okay, sorry. I was blessed with having three sons. Two of them are behind me. It is Gerald, isn't it? Gerald and Derek. Alex was the first. He was born in a rather unusual place, in a place called Otamatata in the South Island. It was a village until he was born, a few weeks before had not been a village at all. It was built to house the people working on a hydro, hydro works called Benmore. I have the um, honour, if you like, or the privilege of knowing that he was the second child born in that village, so he's part of our history. He should have been the first, but he arrived late. <laughs> so there was no hospital there, there was no transport, there was no shops, there was no church, there was absolutely nothing there except a few houses housing families from the workers and um, single men's huts. Sorry, yeah. It would have meant travelling a long way into Oamaru for him to be born under normal circumstances. But fortunately, the Ministry of Works <coughs> built an, an eight-bedded maternity hospital two weeks before Alex was born. Now, had he been the first born there, he would have had a large teddy bear presented to him or to me, but we missed out on that. <laughs> okay. He was a healthy, alert, and I think bright child. I know all mothers say that about their kids, but he really was. <laughs> Even when he was just standing and walking, we didn't have many books and toys. I used to recite the nursery rhymes, and in no time at all, he could pick up the ends of the sentences, like Jack and Jill went up there, and he knew what it was, which I think is incredibly bright. <laughs> he particularly liked our daily walk around the village. There was nowhere for me to go, except walking round and round and round these few houses. So after lunch, I would put him in his pram, and walk round and round and round one way and round and round and round the other. And he loved it. But then, well fortunately, Derek was born a year and two weeks later and I was unable to take Alex out for a walk every day because I was far too busy. And he used to scream his head off. <laughs> he wanted it. I used to try saying to Derek, I'm pushing his pram with my foot, but that wasn't good enough. He screamed until I got him out. <laughs> Alec was a caring and giving toddler. I was, by then, he'd, um, he was sort of just on two and Derek was a year old, pulling himself up on the chair. And um, shows you how caring and giving he was. I was at the kitchen uh, table uh, mixing up mints we didn't get the luxury of having mints ready for us in those days, you did it. And I looked around and there was Alec feeding Derek with raw meat. <laughs> Alec was creative. He liked working with his dad, making things, painting and washing the car, etc., and digging in the garden. Many people have heard this story before, so my family particularly forgive me. Another way Alec was creative was verbally. When he was around six years old at school, he was told to write a story to, uh, that was something special about his mother. And when I read it, he wrote, my mum has four toes on one foot. She can remove a couple of her teeth and she's growing a moustache. 
it wasn't a moustache, I had a couple of hairs here. When he was around 10 years old, he found my Bible in, in a drawer of mine. Neither his father or I were churchgoers. But when I looked at Alec, he was reading the Bible at 11, and he'd read it from cover to cover. And when he was 11, he took himself off to the local Anglican church. Neither his father or his mother went with him. He took a 15 minute walk to get down to the church. Then he, went to, he left school at the end of um, year six and went straight to university where he got his degree in geology, not geology, geography, sorry, sorry about that. But while he was at Varsity, he met a group of young people from the Christian Club. And it was they who introduced him to the church in Takapuna. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't know anything about this group, and I was very concerned. So. I used to go to their meetings once every three, four weeks so that I could keep an eye on what he was doing. <laughs> because he went to, I think at that time, he went to live with someone in the family, which was d difficult for me. By then, his dad wasn't around, so I really didn't know quite what to do. But I hunted everywhere to find evidence of anything negative about the church, and I couldn't find anything. So he continued in his walk and introduced me to a lot of saints too. Many of you are here today and I thank you for your friendship to me and to Alec particularly. <clears throat> My big brother. So, as Mum says, we were born in the middle of the South Island, a year apart, and uh, we were boys growing up together in Glen Innes in, uh, in Auckland. So we had a lot to do with each other, we played. Um, I recall one project uh, which Alex started, which was to build this model boat in the, in the garage, and uh, he did the research and came up with the design. Uh, we made, he made this boat out of plywood, a frigate, and I followed him, <laughs> uh, but mine was not as good as his. But um, we completed the boats, with, complete with motors, and we uh, put them in a pond in the Savage Memorial. And this is one of the many things we did together. Um, we were always at the beach, St Helia's Bay typically, um, splashing in the water, skimming stones, and um, our parents would uh, take us into the, into the bush, often we go to the Waitakere's, um, walk through the bush, up streams. And uh, we'd be uh, back in our neighbourhood, we would uh, be on our bikes, terrorising the neighbours. Um, yeah, we um, played in huts and built tunnels and had the odd fight. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we, uh, we were best mates back in those days. And like Mum said, um, I recall uh, in those early, early years, he's maybe 12 years old when he started, when he joined the local Anglican church and he was playing guitar down there and uh, fully involved. And uh, he was amazing that he uh, had that uh, drive, that uh, desire to find, find some sort of uh, truth, uh, some sort of meaning. Uh, it's very impressive because there's not many 12-year-olds uh, that would uh, do that. You know, it's not a cool thing to do. Um, yeah, he had that. He was different and um, very committed right, right from way back then. But later he uh, introduced me to the uh, local church um, and um, he would uh, take care of me. We'd uh, go to the meetings in Takapuna and uh, I'd be on the back of his motorbike at uh, meetings to Taka in Takapuna. And, um, and then later, um, as our families grew up, our families got to know each other. Uh, 
He's uh, full of he's full of energy and enthusiasm and positive. Um, and in the in the recent years, uh, while he was ill, he he still impressed me with uh, uh, how brave he was. He said he didn't fear death, and he re- he was a re- very real. Yeah, Alex, uh, we are all going to miss you. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, it'd be fair to say that mum and dad produced three very independent, independent and determined children, um, each plotting quite different journeys. And when, when I stand back and look at, I guess, this little landscape of my relationship with Alex, um, there, there are three parts. There's the, the early years with mum and dad in Bromley Place, Glen Innes, in Auckland, and the numerous, numerous family adventures that uh, Derek's referred to. Then there was quite a large chunk of time when, um, from the time that Alex left home and you heard from Mum that that was reasonably early. He was just finished sixth form and took himself off into the world. And so from after that, I guess, um, the three of us, sort of, that, that's when we plotted our own journeys through life. We had our families and, and did what we wanted to do. And then there's the last sort of four to five years. Um, and if, I, I guess if I had a chance to talk to Alex now, which, which was what I was hoping to do last Saturday, um, I'd want to focus on the last part, that's the last few years. Um, and I'd like to do this, and if the, I'm asking for your indulgence here, I'd like to do this by way of, if I could write a letter to Alex, this is what it would say. Alex, na mihi ki a koe tōku tuakana, tōku hua. Ko hinga te tōtara i te wainui a tāne. And that, meant, that's, that means a great tōtara has fallen in the forest. And I, you know, I look around today and see the, see the number of people here, and that's definitely true. You were around when I took my first breath 38 years ago, and I was there when you took your last a week ago. It was a privilege to be there with Jenny, Mum, Peter, Phoebe, Marama, and Henare. It was good that the, you were there with Fano. You were seven years older, and we took different directions in our lives. There were periods when we didn't see much of each other, busy with work, family, and at least for me, multiple and at this moment, unimportant distractions. But there was always that hard to put your finger on intrinsic comfort and warmth from knowing that there is whānau somewhere, no matter where they are in the world. The seven year gap dwindled as we both got older. Our lives seem to be intersecting more and more, and for me the saddest aspect of this is that we won't have time, have the time to get closer. I enjoy the simple pleasure of being around you, trawling up stories from the early years, laughing, talking about our kids, laughing, discussing our parents, and laughing. (laughs) It didn't matter that we may have not have seen each other for a while, being around you was always easy. Despite our different world views, there was, I feel, a mutual respect. There have been some wonderful reasons to get together. Birthdays and weddings, most recently the weddings of Peter and Deborah, two people I'm proud to be uncle to. Two family occasions that brought us all together. Two family occasions that are now, since last Saturday, so much more important. And then there's the other not so wonderful reason to get together, cancer. First dad, and then you. In a perverse and paradoxical way, it brought us closer together. Whether it was dealing with dad's affairs, you and Jenny staying with us in Auckland, or just giving me the kick up the pants I needed to visit you more, although not nearly enough. Through this, I got to know you, and in particular, your passion for life. When most others would have tired and succumbed, you were relentless in your search for a solution. Never losing hope that you would overcome the cancer. You launched a full frontal, physical, mental and spiritual attack. You left no stone unturned, 
That is an incredibly precious lesson you have left with me and others. For me, your spirit is captured in the whakatauki, whaia te iti kahurangi ki te tu oho koi mehe maunga teite, which means if you bow your head, let it be to a lofty mountain. In other words, be persistent and don't let obstacles stop you from reaching your goal. What better gift can an older brother leave for a younger brother? Na mihi nui, Gerald. Now before I finish, there's two more things. First, Jenny, there is so much I want to say to you and about you. I have the deepest heartfelt respect and admiration for you. There is no way Alex could have battled so long and so hard without your quiet, gentle tenaciousness and your unrelenting love. You and Alex were a formidable team, far greater than the sum of the parts. Thank you and know that we will always be there for you and Deborah and Peter. Second, unfortunately, Marama, my wife, couldn't be here today. She's overseas, but she's asked me to read the following message. Dear Alex and Jenny, I met you both almost 30 years ago. To my kind, clever and enthusiastic brother-in-law, I'm really going to miss you. Sending love and aroha to you, Jenny. You have an inner strength second to none. Thinking it Thinking of you all on this very sad day. Haere atu, ra e hoa. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm Jenny's little sister. Um, this is, just, this is going to be really short, but I'd just like to tell you a story about when I first found out that my sister was getting married. I was 21 years old, 1981, working in Rotorua as a physiotherapist. And i just actually a little aside here, Alex was also 21, and I've always been rather secretly impressed that my sister scored a toy boy. <laughs> anyway, I was sitting on the side of the pool and I was taking an exercise class. I was not a very serious physiotherapist, I was probably sort of thinking about something else, and th this letter was delivered to me. And in those days we did write letters. And I opened it up and it was a letter from my sister telling me that she was getting married. And I honestly nearly fell into the pool because I didn't even know she had a boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so this took me so completely by, my, by surprise and I will never forget, I, of course I was so thrilled and I, you know, the wedding and it was just amazing. Anyway, here we are, all these years later, and I'd just like to say on behalf of the Oscars, there's only three of us, uh, that Alex has been a very, very special part of our family, and Alex, I'd like to thank you so much for that. I'd like to thank you for so much for your beautiful children and the gorgeous adults that you've grown into. Thank you for being part of our lives. But lastly, and probably mostly, I'd like to thank Alex for giving my sister so much love, so much joy, and I just can't, I just can't express that enough. He's been such a, be uh, such a blessing. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> there are many things that my dad has taught me over the years, and gifts that he's given me and I'll treasure those forever. Um, as we've heard already today, Dad liked to go on adventures, he liked to walk a lot. Uh, he travelled all over the world pretty regularly for his work um, and when, he, when he'd come back he'd show us pictures and tell us stories and bring us presents um, and they were all you know, very wonderful uh, but the best present I think that he gave me was the love for the environment the, the natural world um, and to this day my connection with nature is basically what grounds me and keeps me he healthy and balanced. Um, Dad loved geography as we all know uh, and when we travelled, which was a lot, I think I'd been on the Cook Strait Ferry and on an aeroplane about a dozen, maybe even two dozen times before I was even two years old, <laughs> um, he would point out the landmarks and talk about the environment around us and I just, I love that. <laughs> just learning about, 
a beautiful country. Um, we always had great big picture books of landscapes and maps and scientific diagrams and birds and animals in the house, which I loved, and a huge stack of um, National Geographics, and Dad and I used to devour them together and chat about it. <laughs> um, every holiday, we'd go on a huge trip somewhere. He would take us on a, an adventure, usually to some beach or walk up a mountain, probably both. Uh, either near or far. I mean, we travelled the whole country. I think he showed me all of New Zealand, literally from Cape Reinga all the way down to Stewart Island and everywhere in between. <laughs> and it wasn't enough just to look at it. We had to get out of the car. We had to go for hours long walks. We had to <laughs> go through the bush, up mountains. We'd go snorkeling, swimming. We'd even Once we even bought, borrowed a um, dinghy from a neighbour to go to an island, which was almost a disaster. Luckily, we had some mask and snorkels to <laughs> bail out the water. <laughs> um, so we had lots of adventures with Dad, and, and it's a contagious kind of addiction, that one. I still practice exploring my environment at every opportunity. Uh, he also gave me the gift of many skills and tools to follow my passions. Most Saturdays during my childhood, uh, Dad and I would spend the day together in the garden, um, just like he did with his dad. He taught me how to mow the lawn, wash the car, water blast the driveway, and fix things and make things and do all sorts of exciting projects. He helped me out with my animals. Um, <laughs> he made me a fish tank. It was just amazing. Um, <laughs> he also taught me how to build a fire and paint how to play the guitar, which is very important to me. Um, what else can I say? <laughs> um, we were both very similar in some ways, both inquisitive and stubborn. <laughs> but um, I'm really grateful that he was able to see me graduate, to launch into my career, to see Peter and Phoebe start their family, and to walk me down the aisle last year. <laughs> Um, sorry, I miss him terribly, but I'll always treasure the gifts that he gave me and the adventures we had together. Um, in case there's anyone who hasn't I met got to be Dad's student in the classes, um, week after week, um, we saw a living testimony of the indestructible divine life. Despite being so weakened physically, Dad's spirit was so strong and exercised to overcome all the limitations and minister the truth and the divine life to us. Um, during this time, I've developed a great respect for Dad. Um, he was an excellent um, student of the Bible, an excellent student of the truth. Um, in the last days that we could still communicate with Dad, one of the last things he told me, um, it's a great thing to have a seeking heart. So I asked the Lord for mercy that I would also have a heart like this for all my days. Um, I've been asking myself lately, if I could choose what kind of dad to have, would I choose, what kind of dad would I choose? Would I choose a dad who's got lots of money? <laughs> um, but I've realized I've got the best dad. Um, he was rich in God rather than other things. There's no, um, this is the best kind of inheritance to have. Um, and so now my question is changing to a different question. Um, what kind of dad do I want to be? So I'm realizing more and more that dad has left me the best pattern to imitate and I don't want my children to have any less. I wish they could have met him. Thank you for everything, dad. We're gonna miss you. I recently told some brothers and sisters that I feel that Alex probably fitted about 80 years worth of living into his 55 years. Many of you know that he was a very energetic person, always on the go, always with some little project. He took every opportunity and he has testified that he has lived a life of no regrets. 
Um, Alex and I both came into the church life in our first year of university. I in Fielding in 1976 and he in Auckland in 77. In 1980, we served together um, in the children's meetings of the church in Takapuna. And this experience strengthened our feeling that the Lord was drawing us together. We became very much in love and in May 1981, we got engaged and in December that year, we were married. He was in his second year of a master's degree at Auckland University. We found a flat in the city close to the university and I took a job close by and we enjoyed serving the new students in the same way that we also had been served when we were young. In 84, we were both uh, studying part-time and working part-time on the Auckland University campus and serving. He was in his second year of Greek and his first year of Hebrew. He suggested we should spend a year abroad from the end of 84 to the end of 85 um, to go to Israel first so that he could continue studying Hebrew and also to visit our relatives in Britain and um, the churches there and in Europe. That year, and especially the four months we spent in Israel, living on a kibbutz and learning how to speak Hebrew, that remains one of the highlights of my life. And I realized that without Alex, I could never have planned such a trip or had such an experience, and I'm very grateful to him for that. And I always felt so safe with him. He diligently studied the biblical languages, but he's often stated that he has no natural ability with languages, so it was a real labor with a purpose for him. And I can testify that he has consistently kept up his ability in the biblical languages by reading verses in Greek and Hebrew every day. Uh, Deborah was born in May 1986, seven months after we returned to New Zealand from that trip. She was such a joy to us, and she and Alex had a special relationship. Um, when she was nine months old, the three of us went to Taipei with the full-time training there. There, um, it was made known that there was a need for people trained in languages to, to, work with, to um, translate the gospel publications, the mystery of human life and the life lessons into as many languages as possible. So Alex was able to join the Hebrew team to translate into Hebrew. And um, later, uh, when we returned from Taipei, we were living in Nelson. He actually traveled to Canada for 11 weeks, spent 11 weeks there working with a native um, Hebrew speaker, and they completed the project there. Um, in the meantime, Deborah and I were in Nelson, and Peter was due to be born just two weeks after Alex returned from Canada. Fortunately, he was not early, and <laughs> Alex was there for his birth. And those, those, uh, we had four years in Nelson um, as a young family, and they were very precious precious years um, with the family and with the sweet church life there. Um, then in, um, oh, so at, this, at that time, Alex was continuing to serve the Lord full time. And this was quite normal to me. I never expected him to follow any other career. And to serve together with him in the Lord's work was fulfilling and enjoyable to me. In 91, we moved to Hamilton and have lived here until now. We came here for the Lord's work, especially with the training center. And the years in Hamilton have given us many experiences, some bitter, mostly sweet. I thank the Lord for what he's been able to do in both of us during this time. We've seen our children grow from primary years through secondary school and onto university. We've had many brothers and sisters and many meetings in our home. We have both served, both in the church and the training center. Alex was always so busy. He gave himself 100% plus, both to the work and to his family, as others have testified. Um, in the work, I sensed that he was not only spending, but also being spent. Um, one thing that I treasured and admired in Alex was his large heart for the Lord's work, um, especially in some of the less easy places to visit. Um, he made many trips aboard, um, to Indonesia, to Myanmar, to India, caring for the believers, the churches and the trainings in those places. I never resented his going. I just admired his large heart even to risk himself sometimes for the work of the Lord. Another thing I'm in awe of is his appetite for the ministry. 
I think he read every book published by the Living Stream Ministry as it became available. He had such a rich deposit of the truth. During the years, three years of Alex's illness, we've seen both our children married. He was able to be the celebrant at Peter and Phoebe's wedding and to walk Deborah down the aisle to be married to Nick in April last year. So the Lord was very faithful. Alex has also continued to speak in the full-time training classes, even when he was so weak. And time after time, I saw him being miraculously strengthened by the Lord when he went to speak to the trainees. He deeply appreciated his salvation, and he has a strong desire to see others come to know the Lord and experience the Lord as he did, especially his relatives. This is evident in one of his favorite hymns, which he chose for us to sing today. Do come, oh do come, let him who thirsts and will take freely the water of life. So Alex, I have to say goodbye now and I thank you. Thank you for everything. Um, it's been hard for me to see you suffering both in body and soul, but I am persuaded that as you yourself stated several times that this momentary lightness of affliction has been working out for you an eternal weight of glory. And I thank the Lord for joining us together for 34 years. Thank you, family, for sharing those precious thoughts of Alex with us. Um, now we're going to have sing the second hymn, but we're going to have the the ones that are currently attending the New Zealand Training Centre here in Hamilton to stand and sing the hymn for us first. And after they've sung the hymn right through, we're going to ask those who have those in the audience here that have attended the training centre over the last is it 25 years, Ray? Around 25 years. If you've attended the training centre, could you then stand where you are and sing the hymn again through? And then we're going to ask the trainees to sing the hymn again for the third time. Okay, so maybe we should um, stand and sing. Is it what? Just wait. Okay. Okay, we'll just wait.
<laughs> that hymn really expresses Alex's life. Like uh, has been said, a life of no regrets. Well, I had the... Ah, oh, by the way, my name is Ray McNee. Um, I've served with Alex in the training centre from its inception. And uh, I also had the pleasure of knowing Alex for 38 years. Uh, first was as a young brother, uh, learning to follow the Lord and learning to serve full time. During most of this time, I was with him in a daily way. Having morning revival at the university, praying, studying the truth, and preaching the gospel. You know, Alex never wavered in his faith. Uh, and he always expressed a strong desire to serve the Lord full time, along with Jenny, his wife. Uh, and of course, during this time, he studied the Bible, books of the ministry, and Greek and Hebrew. You know, it was said that Alex didn't have an aptitude toward languages. Uh, well, I actually studied with him in Raja, and he had a lot more than I had. <laughs> uh, but uh, later, along with a, a number of couples and young people, Alex and Jenny went to Taipei and uh, to attend the first full-time training uh, on this earth. That was at the end of 1987. Uh, when we returned to New Zealand, there was a strong desire to have a training centre. That was an incredible experience, and it infused us all with a desire. And uh, in October of 1989, we purchased the complex in Beale Street uh, with the purpose of training the saints and possibly having a full-time training. Uh, when Alex and Jenny moved from Nelson uh, in August of 1991, uh, we began our service for the churches in New Zealand and for the, for the uh, young people. You know, Alex's uh, contribution uh, in establishing the full-time training was irreplaceable. Uh, he was absolutely one with the ministry uh, and following the training that uh, was begun in Anaheim in the English language, and being able to take class subjects and turn them into a curriculum uh, and then developing a journal for assessment of the life subjects, uh, this work he did uh, enabled us to satisfy New Zealand Qualifications Authority and the Ministry of Education. Um, he had an incredible ability to just work or let gobbledygook stuff out with the government. And uh, one time <clears throat> I was in the training in Anaheim and uh, I asked uh, one of the brothers there who was uh, leading the training, I said, uh, how come you're not registered with the government like we are? Do you know what his answer was? Because we haven't got Alex Lanning. <laughs> so... <clears throat> In the 25 years of serving with Alex, I sense he was absolutely one with me. We never argued. 25 years, we never argued. We didn't argue over practice or ways. Our relationship, I felt, was very much like uh, Paul and Timothy in the Bible. Alex was like my spiritual son that became my co-worker. I appreciated his love for the Lord, the churches, and the training. Uh, he abounded in gifts and qualities that I lack. We were a great pair. <laughs> um, his organizational skills were amazing. Uh, during audits by New Zealand Qualifications Authority and Ministry of Education, uh, when they asked to see evidence of students' records, he was able to produce them immediately. You know, they were kind of mean. They would, they would talk and they go, 
okay, show us the records of Solomon Ling, third semester, uh, life subject. And Alex is just going to pull it out of the file. Amazing. Even though I was an, an old dinosaur, uh, he never despised me <laughs> and always supported me in uh, whatever matter we had to develop. You know, I'm so thankful uh, to the Lord that when he got sick and was in need of rest, Andrew Hutchison took over his responsibilities. Uh, it was, I think the Lord is very merciful. Uh, when Alex got sick, uh, Andrew just finished his PhD. And so uh, when Andrew came in to take over, uh, Alex helped him to understand the subject. And then he handed everything over and never wanted to take back his job, even in the times uh, when the cancer was in remission. And he said, if I fully recover, I never want to have to do this again. Just <laughs> give it to Andrew. Yeah. Uh, two years ago, he took uh, half a class with Doug. He shared a class because he was just kind of coming back. And then uh, last year, he took the whole class. You know, he, <clears throat> he had the period of rest. But then when he came back, he re returned to the eldership, the elders meeting, and also um, to bear the burden in the training and would often call me uh, to come in fellowship. So even up to this last month, he joined the co-workers meeting in Christchurch and also the conference there. I love Alex so much. <laughs> Thank you for your faithfulness and the joy of being able to serve and coordinate with you for 25 years. Oh, Lord. I'd like to read um, some verses that will help my spirit. These are normally in my office for the girls who come to my office. <laughs> um, this is from the book of Philippians. Uh, this is the Apostle Paul uh, speaking. He's in prison and... Uh, he's facing the possibility of execution. And he says, For I know that for me this will turn out to salvation through your petition and the bountiful supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation that in nothing I will be put to shame, but with all boldness as always, even now, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether through life or through death. And then verse 21, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Uh, we've heard already uh, the testimonies, and we'll hear more. Uh, Alex lived Christ. To him, to live was Christ. But this verse says, to die is gain. And then, he's, then Paul said, but if I am to live in the flesh, if this to me is fruit from my work, then I do not <coughs> know what I will choose. So if he was to remain alive, he didn't know what he would choose. He said, but I'm constrained between these two. I have the desire to, be with, to depart and be with Christ, for this is far better. You know, it's not like the Apostle Paul was not with Christ. 
he was with Christ. But with, when he was, if he was to die, he would be with Christ in a fuller way. And that's what Alex has experienced. He is actually with Christ in a fuller way without the restraints of the mortal failing body. And uh, it's far better. Right? So I'm just so thankful to the Lord um, that I had this time with Alex and, uh, and uh, Jenny. Actually, uh, both of them served the whole time. And uh, I, I, I think uh, Jenny um, expressed, you know, unconditional love and care for Alex. It's, I have the highest regard for her and the uh, highest respect for Alex. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So <clears throat> I'm Roger Good. Uh, I just came in yesterday from the United States of America. Um, you may tell by my accent, but anyway. <laughs> um, and actually, there's a number of brothers who would like to have been here at this time, uh, but couldn't make it. And so anyway, they send their con condolences to Jenny and to the family. Uh, Brother Rick Scatterday, Albert Lim, some of these other brothers. Uh, uh, actually, Rick was almost, he got on a he got a ticket already to come, but he couldn't make it. So anyway, uh, so anyway, um, I <coughs> actually I my my first contact with Alex was uh, we were at the same primary school, and my my mother babysat the the, the uh, Lanning children. <laughs> uh, so that was our first kind of contact with the family, and then um, uh, then I went to university and um, through Derek, and then Alex. Uh, came in contact with the Christian club at the Auckland University and um, Alex was really uh, a real shepherd to me uh, to help you know bring me into the Christian life and the church life um, and actually what I'd like to share is, is some just to, some words and then just some little anecdotes when I, I was talking to my wife Julie about Alex she said the word that stands out to me is he was absolute he really he, he saw something and he just gave himself to uh, carry out his, what he saw. The second one, he was bold. Um, I remember at Auckland University, um, he was talking to the, student, the editor of the student paper and wanting to get a, uh, an article published in the student paper on the mingling of God and man. <laughs> And it wasn't that easy, <laughs> trying to persuade this, this uh, editor of the paper to publish this article. But he did it, and it was published, even though they, they put some funny cartoon in there. Uh, the third word was, is constituted. Alex was constituted with the, the word, with the ministry, with the truth. And he brought me into this kind of exercise. Um, I lived with Alex and Jenny actually just after they got married for probably a year or two, I think. And you know, we, we would always be reading the Bible together, reading the ministry. And I remember we would travel across uh, the ferry in, in Devonport. We read Hudson Taylor's biography <laughs> on that, that little journey. So, um, and then another uh, word is he was deep. Actually, I'm going through alphabetical order, but I'm not going to go to the end of it. <laughs> A, B, C, D, deep. <laughs> um, uh, I remember one time, I, actually it was just before I, I, I uh, traveled from New Zealand and I, I was having a little bit of a hard time and I, I went to Alex and I said to Alex, I said, you know, what, if you would could kind of summarize what we're doing here, what, what, what's life all about, what's the church life all about? He said, he said it's about two mysteries, Christ and the church. And that just stuck, stuck with me all of these years. I thought, wow, you know, there's a lot of things that go on. And can, you can be kind of stumbled in this and that or bothered by this and that, but you know, if, if you have these two, you know, Christ and the church, and just take care of this, you can be preserved. And I, I really believe that, was, that preserved me and, and uh, I believe was, was also governing Alex. The, the, the next word, E for exercised. <laughs> he was exercised. Uh, we had, um, as uh, Jenny mentioned, we... Uh, there was the consideration to have a, a place right near the campus so that we could contact the students easy 
And we, so we had this little flat in Mount Street. There was a pub on one side and a pub on the other side, and we were in the middle. <laughs> it was kind of interesting. <laughs> anyway, we, I was just impressed that Alex and Jenny had such an open home and an open heart to receive so many visitors. And uh, of course, I was Roger the Lodger, so they received me. <laughs> I was the first one, and Derek was with us too. <laughs> so, um, and then uh, I'm going to switch the order a little bit. Greek, of course, we've already heard a little bit about Greek. Um, but uh, um, I remember, actually, I was in a meeting, um, and I heard a message. Brother Lee said if he, if he was in, uh, uni at university, he would study Greek and Hebrew. And I thought, well, I'm in university. Maybe I should think about studying Greek and Hebrew. Actually, it was through Alex and Ray and the, the other brothers. We, all of us, there was about six of us studying Greek, and we really didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> I remember Ray and I talking, what's a participle? You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, we stuck, at it, stuck at it, and, and another thing that uh, actually Brother Lee shared with us, he said, tell the brothers who are studying Greek to read the New Testament in Greek every day. And I, I, you know, this was, uh, you know, I, I knew that Alex was doing it when we were studying, but Jenny confirmed it. Actually, he just had this kind of view just to keep reading the New Testament in, in Greek, just, and, and then, well, it, it's, um, <clears throat> and just for the sake of the, the, the truth and the ministry and the, and the Bible. And then Hebrew, it's the next letter, <laughs> Greek and Hebrew. Um, so Hebrew, uh, Alex and I, we decided to, carry, you know, to continue with our studies, and we studied Hebrew together. The first experience we had was a 10-day crash course in Hebrew. We just ate, slept, and breathed Hebrew for 10 days. It was like, ah! <laughs> but Alex and I... Uh, and then, of course, this, as, as Jenny shared, this led to um, Alex and Jenny going to... Israel for the, the, this period of time, you know, staying on a kibbutz and learning modern Hebrew. And then uh, I, we, we ended up in the training together in, uh, in Taiwan in 1987. And I remember sitting in a meeting, and I was sitting next to Alex, and there was an announcement. Anybody who knows anything about any foreign language, please go to such and such a room. And I, was, I, was, I said to Alex, are you going to go? He said, yeah, I think I will. I said, well, maybe I can go too. I, at least I can use a dictionary, you know, <laughs> look up some words. And so we ended up in this project, um, and it really, this, was, this really changed my life. Uh, for the last 25 years, has really impacted my life. Anyway, we were, as Jenny shared, we were translating the ministry into to modern Hebrew, and I think they may have retranslated all of our work. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was the start, and, and really we had a lot of prayer for the Lord's move in Israel and for the Hebrew language. And, uh, and then, then what impressed me was Alex really wanted to see this project finished, and like Jenny shared, he, he's, he took some time off and went to Canada. to meet The, the only native speaker of Hebrew in the whole Lord's recovery lived in Canada. <laughs> and so Alex, we realized we needed him, right? We, we, and so Alex you know, spent this time, and actually I got to visit this brother, um, and he couldn't speak more highly of, of Alex, even though he's you know, no longer among us, but he, he really appreciated that time with Alex. And, um, and then finally, the last word, so out of order, but faithful. Alex was faithful, faithful to the end. Even, you know, I didn't have that much to, to you know, see him through his time of suffering, but I realized he's, he's faithful to the Lord. He's faithful to the Lord whom he served. He's faithful to the ministry. He's faithful to the word. He's faithful to the church. And... I just appreciate his, his pattern, his exercising. And I, I, I miss our brother, and I appreciate so much what he's done over the years. And just his example of giving himself to the Lord and to the, to the service. And, and now he's gone to join the, the cloud of witnesses to stand and, and, and cheer us on. <laughs> Keep going. Run the race. Run the race before us. Amen. And I, I also, I just appreciate also, just like to say a thank you to, to Jenny, just for all that you've done for Alex over the years. And, 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 and especially, I know it can't, have been diff, it can't have been easy these last few years and just how much you just took care of Alex and you, you kept him alive for so many, you know, for, for all of our, our, our sakes. Amen. Thank you, Rob. Hi, my name's Peter Rawlins, and I've, I knew Alex for probably 35 years. Um, and I'd just like to give you a little snapshot of Alex's life of service. I only know Alex as the brother who served the Lord. Whenever you touch Alex, he's serving the Lord. Um, and he had a big impact on me in my Christian life. Um, so 
I first met Alex when I was studying at Auckland University in 1981. He was the president of the Auckland University Christian Club. He had been in the church life about four years at that stage. I was just a worldly young man who was looking to add a bit of God to my life. Um, so I put my name down at the Christian Club table and to my surprise I received a visit to my home in Takapuna from Alex and another brother. I'm still not sure how they got my address. Uh, any, anyway, m the net impression I got from that visit was that I am so different from these guys. We have nothing in common. Okay, anyway, to cut a long story short, after much infusion of faith, 10 weeks later, um, Alex baptized me in the Hamilton Lake. Um, that was during a, a young people's retreat. Actually, Roger got baptized at the same time. Um, so his serving life attracted me and shepherded me into the service. It was so good to be under his influence in those early days. He was absolute, he had no mixture, he loved the Lord, he loved the ministry, and he loved to serve. So that's kind of like a common theme, this, this matter of the absoluteness. Um, so this place was Bethel to me, an awesome place, and this brother was serious with the Lord and with his purpose. So before I knew it, I was joining him in the service uh, to serve the young people's meeting, to join him in the service for the campus work. And then not long after that, Alan followed the lamb to Taipei, and also I was there uh, witnessing the Lord's move in, in his body. And I remember him saying that Taipei was a big highlight for him in the church life. Um, even though he spent a lot of that time in translation, uh, it was still uh, a big, big deal for him. So then after Taipei, he returned to New Zealand. I went to the States and uh, got married. And then 10 years later, I migrated back to New Zealand with my family um, and served in the full-time training here again and joined Alex again in the service. Uh, and together, also, we closely worked in the high school work. Um, and our two boys were the same age, so we had uh, a bit to do with each other, or quite a bit to do with each other in that, that area as well. Um, so we went from having nothing in common to one another to having much in common with one another. Oh, we had Christ in common with one another. We had God's move in common with one another. Uh, and that was, that was the linking, linking thing. So different naturally, but um, when we got into the divine and mystical realm, it was so marvellous. So our labour together has been a real encouragement to me and a supply over the years. It's hard to imagine the church life without Alex. It's hard to imagine the work without Alex. Uh, but at least he's left us a pattern of one who saw a vision of God's economy on the earth and gave himself wholly to carry it out. Thank you, Lord, for our brother's life of service. May his testimony speak to us and burden us to hasten your return. My name is Douglas, and I just have known Alex for the last 39 years, like so many others, but really, um, he was my beloved and honoured brother. Although he's younger than me, I always consider him as my senior co-worker, because he ran the race faster than me with less hindrances. He was absolute. And what I, well, is something I want, particularly want to talk about, but for the last year and a half, I've been able to meet with Alex almost every day, Monday to Friday. Uh, and we've been able to meet just for 15 minutes, sometimes less than that, just depending on, on his, his condition on, on a particular day, just to pray together and touch the Lord. His spirit and prayer was something I will never, ever forget. For eternity, I remember his burden to pray. Sometimes we would just sit down and he'd begin to spontaneously thank and praise the Lord and offer just a, a sacrifice of love to the Lord. Other times he'd ask me, what should we pray for today? And I would tell him some, some area in the, tra in the training that needed our prayer. And we would just sit down and release our prayer together. But uh, even apart from that, he had a burden to shepherd a brother in South America. So once a week we'd have a Skype call with Brother Malcolm in South America just to shepherd and pray with him. And Malcolm would have certain ones to pray for. He would write them down and diligently pray for them. This is in his intense illness. And sometimes at the end of that call, he would be thoroughly exhausted, but had so much feeling and burden uh, to pray and to shepherd that dear brother. But what I particularly want to share about was that, uh, well, I've, I've served with him in the full-time training since 1993, but in 2011, he asked me to go with him to Burma and India and through Thailand that we could take some classes in the full-time training. Well, we were in India for a week, and both of us got violently ill there, and we couldn't do very much. 
apart from languish on our bed for a week. But when we got to Burma, we, we recovered and we got to Burma. And he had a tremendous burden for the, for, or let's call it Myanmar, uh, for the church and for the full-time training in Myanmar. Uh, he had opened the way in the 1990s for six young people, well they weren't all young, but six trainees, three brothers and three sisters to come to the full-time training in Hamilton. And they became the seeds of the translation work of, of the uh, ministry in Burma and also the means by which the full-time training could be carried out there. So he arranged for them to come, train them, and they went back there and established the training. He visited that country on numerous occasions. And when I went there, I was amazed at his energy and his burden and his intensity. He would even get up early in the morning and go for a run down the streets in Yangon. Man, it's so scary in that place. There's just the cars everywhere and smog. He would just be off and come back fully energized for the day's work. And he, there were three things that he was really burdened about. One was that the training would be properly established um, with the proper syllabuses and following the Living Stream Ministry training in a full, thorough way. So he put this, uh, set the training on a proper foothold and also that the training could be carried out in a proper environment, in a proper um, uh, established building. The, the, the building they were using was a blind school uh, and it was very substandard. And he helped the brothers find a piece of land. He helped design the building and arrange for the construction that they now have a lovely training center in the countryside in Myanmar. And also for the translation of the material and also in the Bible in both Hebrew and Greek and for the carrying out of the, of the tra translation of all the ministry publication materials. So it was just an honor and a privilege to be with my dear brother. I will never forget that time. I will remember in eternity the time we had together. It was remarkable. Now what I'd like to do now is to read to you and particularly to Sister Jenny a letter from the brothers in Myanmar. Um, I'll read it as they've written it. Just remember their English is not their first language but um, I'll read it uh, as they've written it. Remembrance and appreciation letter concerning our dear brother Alex Lanning. To dear brother Ray McNee, we would like to send some comfort words to sister Jenny and family on behalf of the local churches, full-time training, Myanmar Gospel Room in Myanmar. Please pass on this letter to sister Jenny and family. Dear sister Jenny, we are all so sad, the same as you and your family about brother Alex. Even though we don't know how to comfort you, but we believe that the Lord will comfort you with a bound and give your heart peace and rest in him. Actually, we are preparing to come to New Zealand in March 2016, and we really hope to see Brother Alex when we come, but unfortunately he left us just before we come. We are so sad that we have lost his presence, but on the other hand, we are glad for him that has gone to the Lord's presence and glory, the place we all will be. There are many words in our hearts to say remembrance and appreciation about our dear brother Alex. Among them, we would like to testify four main points that our dear brother Alex has, be, has been laid a strong foundation for the Lord's recovery in Myanmar. Number one, brother Alex has trained us and perfected us well in full-time training Hamilton. Because of that, those who had gone through FTTH are now leading the local churches in Myanmar. Dear brother Alex, Thank you so much that you perfected us to become useful vessels in the Lord's move. Number two, Brother Alex had a deep burden to gain and perfect the young people through FTTY in Myanmar. So in 2010, Brother Alex came to Myanmar with Brother Douglas and taught the truth for two weeks in FTTY. Before he came, even though FTTY started in 2007. The syllabus that we teach in FTTY is not that proper. We just teach according to what we learned in the past. But when Brother Alex came, he guided us, instructed us, and helped us to enjoy the high peaks of the divine revelation. Also, he brought FTTY up to a higher level to use the same syllabus that has been used by all the other FTT full-time trainings around the world in the Lord's recovery. He also sent the syllabus through email and guided us how to teach, how to present the main points and the key words in the classes. From that time on, we are teaching according to the syllabus in FTTY. Dear Brother Alex, we remember you and really appreciated what you have done for us upon the Lord's move in Myanmar. Sorry. Just. 
Number three, when Brother Alex about, sorry, when Brother Alex heard about that we are preparing to start the translation work of the Old Testament recovery version into Myanmar language, he realized our need for Hebrew language. And for the sake of it, he came to Myanmar again in 2010 and taught the basic Hebrew language and the Greek language for one week and encouraged us to study and practice continually. In 2010, Brother Alex came to Myanmar again and taught in the FTTY for one week and also reviewed Hebrew and Greek for us. Because of Brother Alex, so the basic knowledge of Hebrew and Greek language, now it is a great help for us in translating the Old Testament recovery version and not only so, but also among us, there is one brother teaching Hebrew language class and another brother teaching he Greek language class in FTTY. Brother Alex, all these testified that you just passing on what you have poured out your entire being for the Lord's move on the, this earth. Mm -hmm. Lastly, just one month ago, Brother Alex was gone uh, with the Lord. He asked us to send some basic truths in Myanmar language for Burmese new ones in New Zealand. So, he can, so we sent them to him, life lessons in the Myanmar language software. Just by seeing this, we really can testify that our dear brother Alex lived the life of shepherding the saints and caring for sinners until the end. Our beloved brother Alex, you ran the race well until the end and finished the course. We remember you and appreciate so much what you have done for the Lord's recovery in Myanmar. You set a good pattern for us how we should run the race until the end of our life to fulfill God's eternal purpose. Dear Brother Alex, we do love you. Even though you left us for a while, hopefully we will see you with the Lord in glory in the future. Amen. May the Lord comfort Sister Jenny and your family and all the saints through the life of our dear Brother Alex who loved the Lord and served the Lord for his whole life. With love. The brothers in the local churches, Brother Noah, Brother Saul Lin, and Brother Howard Huan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Don. Um, I'm speaking a little bit about Alex's service in Nelson, in the Richmond area. This was back in eight, 1987 to 1991. And uh, before Alex and Jenny moved down there, uh, of course they'd just been in Taiwan, and they came down to practice somewhat what we learned in Taiwan and the gospel work. Uh, and before Alex and Jenny came and moved to Nelson, I began to consider uh, what it would be to serve full time with Alex. And I was in the meeting when our dear brother stood up to receive the Lord. That was in 1977. Now it's uh, 10 years later, 1987. <laughs> and um, we were going to serve full time together. So the Lord actually shepherded me because uh, I began to consider um, the Lord shepherded me through this verse in 1 Timothy 4.12 Let no man despise your youth. And I considered Alex, of course, as younger than me and uh, you might say less experienced than me but I had a deep realization that I should listen to this brother and receive Receive the portion and the uh, supply that had already been worked into him in a short time, what I considered a short time. And to receive from him and to learn to follow him. Doesn't matter your age physically. It's actually what a person has before the Lord we have to recognize. So, uh, saints, so what... what uh, this verse continues to say it's not no man despise your youth that was for me don't despise this young man right uh, the verse carries on be a pattern in word and this word is to do with utterance and uh, Alex of course we know was able to speak uh, and give utterance in the classes and conferences but also I observed at that time with new ones in the homes and preaching the gospel he had a very good utterance and conduct and love and faith and purity. Purity is related to mo motive with action without mixture. And I felt Alex was someone who just loved the Lord, right? And only had a desire to serve the Lord. He didn't care about his, his status or anything like that. He just wanted to be a lover of the Lord and serve the Lord and advance what was on the Lord's heart. 
So my memories in serving uh, was that he was a pattern in this kind of way. He was a pattern to me as an older brother, and he's been a pattern, I believe, to so many of our children even, right? Many of our children have been to the full-time training as well. So it was a very precious time of serving together. What did we do? We, in our serving life, we, uh, we enjoyed the word together. We prayed together with some others. In the afternoons and even some evenings, we did some door knocking. Knocking on doors to visit people with the gospel. Um, many actually were led to the Lord at that time. And it's interesting there were many people who met with denominations that when we preached the gospel to them, we would ask them, have you ever prayed to receive the Lord? And many of them said, no, we've never prayed in that kind of way. Ray was with us as well. And uh, so in a sense, we were doing what the local, you know, vicar should have done. <laughs> but praise the Lord, many received the Lord. Many were very willing to pray with us. Uh, I think... I would say every time we went out, at least two or three would pray to receive the Lord. Uh, also, I remember um, we had a little secret weapon. It was to sing as we went to the door and as we were going along the street. You know, we were door knocking, but we were singing. It wasn't our, just our job, so-called, but actually it was a joy within us to visit people. And there's a quite a number of people from the exclusive brethren that live in the Nelson area. And we were finding we'd knock on the door and they'd open the door and very politely close it, but very quickly. Wouldn't like to speak with us. So Alex and I, anyway, we developed a little plan. Next door that opened, we'd sing them a hymn. So I remember particularly these two older sisters in the Lord, obviously who they were, they opened the door. And before they could say anything, we said, we would like to sing you a hymn. And they listened to our hymn, and I think they were quite touched by that. <laughs> so this is a good secret. If you go to preach the gospel, learn to sing. So uh, Alex and Jenny, family, of course, increased. Peter was born in Nelson, and we had a lot of little children around that time in Nelson, and uh, we had many pleasant times in their homes, uh, in their home and other homes of the saints. Uh, a very pleasant time. And um, my boys have some very pleasant memories. Uh, of, of being with your family and um, singing and then also acting out the Bible stories is a big thing and uh, playing soccer as well. So uh, Alex liked to play soccer with the little boys and then uh, also I believe at that time also he took some little Bible studies with some of the older, older boys. So I really appreciate Alex's service to the Lord and to the church and to all of us. Okay, because of time, uh, we had another four brothers to speak something, but I think, brothers, you'll have to speak tonight at the uh, New Zealand Training Centre. Um, we just have two letters we've uh, received from two brothers, co-workers in the United States, which I'd like to read. Um, one from Paul Hon and one from Rick Scatterday. Paul Hon says, Dear Sister Jenny, Peter, Phoebe, Deborah, Daphne, Derek, Gerald, and brothers and sisters in the Lord, it is a sad occasion that we have lost our brother Alex, but he is with the Lord. The comforting thing is that we will see him again in the resurrection of the saints as promised by the Lord through his word. Our brother Alex has been faithful to the Lord, his move, his church, and his work. He also has overcome with the Lord in the days of his suffering during his last years. What Apostle Paul said is fitting for our brother Alex. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. It is not how a person begins, but how he finishes. He who endures to the end will be saved. In fact, I have rejoiced to see all the saints who have gone to be with the Lord, having been faithful to the Lord and his recovery all the way. May we take our brother's life and work as a pattern for to live, to love the Lord and to serve him all our days, your brother in the Lord, Paul Hon. 
And then from Rick Scatterday, dear brother Rick, I'm not going to read it all, but I'll read half of it. Um, dear Jenny, Deborah, Peter, Phoebe, and the other members of Alex's family, my strong desire was to be there with you today so as to personally stand with you at this most difficult time. While unavoidably it is through tears, while sensing his personal absence, I strongly join with you in rejoicing and thanksgiving for Alex's exemplary life of progressively advancing in the experience of living with our dear Lord, the one that we love. How I thank and praise the Lord for the opportunity I had to be with Alex in January, that's this January, during the Winter Conference in Christchurch. Undeterred by pain and exhaustion, he valiantly travelled a seemingly impossible distance to join with the co-pursuers of his beloved one final time. I will never forget his courageous manifestation of a living with his beloved, speaking of the Lord, that even the prospect and foretaste of the impending death could not efface. I am deeply encouraged and strongly called by these remembrances of Alex's victorious life with the Lord and aspire to join with you to follow him into this, quote, most wonderful life of all. I am with you in continuing prayer and hoping soon to be with you once again, your brother, Rick Scatterday. Um, this concludes this part. Um, we're going to sing one final hymn, um, hymn number three, Drink a River, Pure and Clear, that's flowing from the throne. I've sung so many times with Alex Lanny, even on Auckland University Quad. And it'd be good to sing this for our brother. Drink a river, pure and clear. After we've finished singing this hymn, um, the pallbearers will carry Alex out to the car to the hearst, and then we will have some refreshments. We ask that the family could enjoy the refreshments first. Um, just a reminder, if you haven't signed the guest book, please sign the guest book. Uh, the time at the graveside, that's for family and for those who have been invited to go to the graveside, so that's just not open. And then at 6 p.m. tonight, um, the New Zealand Training Centre is putting on a dinner, a free dinner, for any who have come from out of town or out of Hamilton. Um, they are welcome to come to the New Zealand Training Centre in Beale Street at 6 o'clock. And this will be followed at 7 o'clock with a, like a memorial testimony meeting, which, which will be open for any, anyone to come along and speak something for Alex or on behalf of Alex or some memory of Alex. That's at 7 p.m. tonight. So the dinner is at 6 p.m. for those from out of town. The, the a further memorial testimony meeting will be at 7 p.m. So can we just stand and sing the song, Drink a River Pure and Clear That's Flowing from the Throne.
let's remain standing and just pray. Lord, we just thank you for all the sweet memories we have of our brother Alex Lanning. Amen. Lord Jesus, we love you. Amen. And we're here committing our brother's body to the earth, Amen. dust to dust. But we have the strong assurance and confidence that he is one spirit with you. Amen. That he will rise again. Praise the Lord. Amen. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. And we ask for your comfort Amen. to every member of Alex's family. Amen. We thank you that you are resurrection. You are life. Amen. You are the one we believe in. Amen. We love you once again. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Can we just remain standing? Last verse as we're walking out, Jesus called me one day. Just carry on walking. Jesus called me one day to the holiest place to live in its presence divine. Hallelujah. Deep in the 